God, as we open your word this morning. You have been challenging me with these words over the last few weeks. Lord, I pray that you would give me clearness of thought. Hide me behind your cross. Lord, speak to each one of us as we open your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I don't know how many of you remember um, the magazine Highlights for Children. Um, I remember my mom and dad getting us a <clears throat> subscription, or getting me a subscription for Highlights for Children when I was little. And while we were living in Marion, I believe, somebody gave Rebecca and Anna a whole, like, five or six years worth of highlights. And um, I remember we, the kids would peruse them and they would, they would, Kill the books basically, and then we finally toss them out. But um, one of the one of the features in highlights was a feature called Goofus and Gallant. Remember Goofus and Gallant? Um, they were they were two brothers, um, and Goofus always did the dishonorable thing, and Gallant always did the honorable thing. And as you can see on the on the screen right now, it says Goofus knocks down a child's snowman. Gallant helps a child build a snowman. And so the question we could really ask this morning is, are you a goofus? Are you a gallant? And as we go through the sermon, I want you to think about this idea of being a goofus or a gallant. The Bible tells us a story of two brothers very early in the, in the scriptures. And these two brothers are the first two people that are not created but are born. Um, their names are Cain and Abel. And some suggest even that, um, that they might be twins. And we often feel like um, Cain and Abel are very much like Goofus and Gallant. You know, Cain was the Goofus and Abel was the Gallant. Cain was just a farmer like his father, while Abel was a shepherd. Now, it's interesting because God at some point must have given... Adam and Eve, some instructions for worship. And here's why I say that. Because we notice if we look at if we look at Adam, if we look at Abraham, if we look at Job, if we look at some Noah, they all offered sacrifices to the Lord. This was long before um, they gave thank offerings. This was long before um, Mose, Moses put all that into a codified law. So, so God had must have given them some instructions. And so the brothers bring their offerings of worship to God. And you all know the story, or some of you know the story. Cain's offering is rejected, and Abel's is accepted. And so I want us to look at Genesis 4, 6-7. And God says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. I want us to notice, if you have your Bibles, you can kind of see this. The Lord rebukes Cain, but as he does, God offers his grace to Cain. He warns that he warns them that I'm giving you a second chance. I'm going to give you more chances here. But if you don't change your ways, sin is around the corner. And God reminded Cain, as he reminds us, that sin is always just around the corner and it desires to control us. It's with this background that I want us to dive back into First John. Um, we looked at the first part of this, um, we looked at a little bit of this um, just a few moments ago in Sunday school. We were in 1 John 3, um, 1 through 10, and now we're going to be in 1 John 3, 11 through 24. And here's what John writes. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. 
We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. And so here, in chapter 3, John continues this theme of love one another, do what is right. Love one another. Do what is right. If there, if there could be any theme for us this summer, it's love one another. Do what is right. And he makes mention of Cain and Abel, who we just looked at. And Cain did what was wrong, and Abel did what was right. Now, we don't know what Cain did that was wrong. We don't know why Cain's offering was not accepted and why Abel's offering was accepted. We can, we can surmise all kinds of things. One of the things, just, to, just one little sidelight here, is we know that because Cain's offering was rejected, he hated, he hated Abel because of it. And you know what? There are times, Christians, there are times, brothers and sisters in Christ, where we will do the right thing and people will not like what we do. Especially if they're, especially if they're in the world, there, there, there are times that we're going to say, this is what is right. And they might not agree because they don't agree with us. We, we might be off the beaten track. We might, we, we might not be of their thinking. But we, as followers of Christ, must do the right things. And sometimes we will be hated for it. Now, that doesn't mean go out and do stupid stuff and say I'm being persecuted. Alright? Because there's some people who do that. They do dumb things and then wonder why people say, oh man, you're such a hater. But Jesus says, don't be surprised. If you're doing the right things for the right reasons, don't be surprised. Jesus echoed these words, but he tells us that he has come to overcome the world. Note what John declares is the antidote for hate. Next verse. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. Ouch. God has really been dealing with as we continue through this, God has really been, over the last two, three weeks, God has really been dealing with me in this whole area. Love is the antidote for hate. John reminds us that we cannot hate a brother or sister in Christ and have the life of Christ in us. We can't hate a brother and sister in Christ because of what color carpet they chose for the church and still have the love of Christ in us. Churches have split over the color of carpet or whether we should sing modern worship songs or traditional worship songs, whether we should have hymns, whether we should have pews or whether we should have chairs. Church, this is not the way it should be. Love is the antidote for hate. We are well familiar with what John 3.16 says, right? That God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But did you know there's another John 3.16, 1 John 3.16? Listen to what this says. And we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So also... We ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Wow. Wow. God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us so that if we believe we can have eternal life. Now you're going to hear this theme over and over over the next couple weeks. As we continue through John, John tells us that God is love. And if we are to be Christ followers, we need to be love as well. Real love is a sacrificial love. 
And I believe that God desires that we show that sacrificial love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. But I also believe that God would say that we should extend that love to our neighbor. After all, didn't Jesus say that the greatest commandment is to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves? You may remember, it's recorded in Luke chapter 10. A Pharisee comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? What are the commandments? How do you see it, says Jesus? The Pharisee says, Well, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, You have spoken well. And then Luke records this. He says, And the man, wanting to justify himself, asked the question, And who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Is it simply the people who reside within these four walls? Jesus goes on to tell a story about a man who was on his way to Jericho. He was on the Jericho Road. And, and uh, I've seen pictures of the road to Jericho. And it's more like a pathway along the cliff. And the man is walking, and there, there, there are a couple of wide spots in the, in the pathway. And he's walking along on the way to Jericho, and got these guys jump out of the bushes, and they beat him, and they beat him to a bloody pulp, and they leave him for dead. First person that comes along is a priest. Now imagine, this is, this is a, a tiny footpath. Hmm. I'm going. I'm going up to the temple. I can't get myself dirty, so he walks around the man. This was a Jewish man laying on the road to Jericho. A few minutes later, a temple assistant comes and hears the cries for help. Help me! Help me! And he walks by. I don't want to get my hands dirty. Jesus said a third man comes on the way to Jerusalem. But he's a Samaritan. You all know how the Jewish people felt about Samaritans. Mm. They were half breeds. They were they were ugly. They were they were they were the least of these. Jesus tells us that the man saw the man and he had compassion on him. He poured oil on the wounds and he bandaged them up and he put them on his donkey and he took them to an inn and he told the innkeeper, here's money that takes care of this, this gentleman. I want you to take good care of him while I go on and do my business. He said, if for some reason he costs more than I give you, the next time I'm co I come through I'll settle up my accounts. Then Jesus asked this question. Who was the robbed man's neighbor? And the Pharisee replies, the one who showed compassion. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. I think in the church today, we, we, we get all caught up in Sometimes we get so caught up in the rules that we forget to have compassion. We forget to have mercy. 1 John 3.17 If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that? On Friday, a week ago, we headed to Canada. 
and I think we were in Syracuse, and uh, we were in, we had some Wi-Fi, we got to go to Chick-fil-A while we were there, and I pulled my phone out and clicked onto the Wi-Fi, and one of the first things that came up was, what about the fire in Eldrum? That was, that was Friday, that was Thursday night, Friday, the night before we left, and, um, and so I was, I was kind of watched, I'm like, well, I kind of feel my hands are tied, I'm, I'm like out here in the middle of nowhere, um, I don't have my phone numbers with me, and, but I was really, what was really cool was to watch how our community rallied around this family. And, and uh, what was really cool is, as I was looking at, I uh, was continuing to watch the You Might Be From Eldred Facebook page, and I was really cool to see one of our people's names, one of the people from this church pop up. Hey, how are we doing for donations? I thought that was really cool. You know, that's what it means to love on our community. That, that's what it means to be a good neighbor. And, you know, and I think, when I think back, and sorry, Pam, we're, we're going to step on each other's sermons here. <laughs> um, but when I think back, the, the last couple of weeks we've had an opportunity. We went to Rochester one weekend um, to look at some statues and uh, ended up at the Susan B. Anthony house. And then on our way home, we stopped in Seneca Falls. Um, and I real, and then we had district conference in, in between. We, we were talking to Ruth and Steve Strand, and this idea that Jesus tells us, yes, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he says, "Go into all the world and preach the gospel, and teach." and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples everything that I have taught you. So we have that part of the gospel, the part where we proclamation that, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus came that, to die for us, that, to, that Jesus came to rise again for us, that he, that he went to prepare a place for us, there's, and that we must believe in the name of Jesus. There, there's that part. But there's this other part that five men in 1843 were so concerned about. One of those guys' names was Orange Scott. You've heard about Orange Scott. And he was so concerned about this issue of slavery. The Methodist Church was saying nothing, and they, they, they basically were saying nothing. They're like, well, we, our hands are tied. We really can't do it. Um, if, you, if, you, if you've been following the news, you know that the Methodist Church is in another crisis, just like it was in 1843. And guess what? The bishops don't want to say a word again. We need to pray for our friends in the Methodist Church. They have a big special general conference coming up next summer. But Orange Scott and Luther Lee and Luther, Lucius Matlat said, you know what? There's something to this going and preaching the gospel. But there's also something... The, the modern word we use is social justice. The word we would have used 50 years ago is the social gospel. I like the word that Dr. Mullen used, the words that Dr. Mullen used at district conference. She said, we can call it social justice, but you might be able to call it biblical justice. And so this is what's I say all that because I really want to set this up. So, so when we went to Rochester, we heard about Susan B. Anthony and, and the, the votes for women and how the Wesleyans were involved in that, the Wesleyan Methodists. Five years after the Wesleyan Church started in 1843, five years later, at a Wesleyan Methodist chapel in Seneca Falls, the First Women Rights Convention. And we're not talking about radical. We're not talking radical things. We're talking about... People, that, that my wife is not my piece of property. She's not my piece of property. She is created in God's image just like I am. And so equal rights, that, that women could own property, or that women could vote. And so it was radical. These, these new Wesleyans were all about freeing people from slavery. They were all about women's rights. And, and engaged in all that, um, it was really kind of interesting to see how it all comes together because um, Susan B. Anthony was good friends with Frederick Douglass and Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony were good friends with some of the early Wesleyans. 
it's really interesting how, how slavery and women's rights and the temperance movement were all interconnected. And they were, they were, they were, yes, they were preaching the gospel because Orrin, um, there was another guy, his name was Adam Crooks, and he was the first northern pastor, Wesleyan pastor, to go to the south during the Civil War, War era. They tried to hang him, they tried to shoot him, um, all because he believed that all men and women are created equal. But they also wanted somebody to preach the gospel down there. And, or, and, and, and Adam Crooks, he was known as being anti-slavery, anti-slavery, uh, anti anti-alcohol, anti-anything anti wrong. Wow, what if we could get back to that as a church? Yes, we want to preach the gospel, but we also want to make sure that biblical justice is happening. I believe what some of those guys were saying in the early Wesley Methodist Church is this, that, righteous, that righteousness and holiness and justice are all connected together. I am so glad that we are a part of a district that is doing something about it. I am so excited that we are part of... Um, <laughs> I'm so excited that we're, we're, we're a part of something called the Jericho Road Health Center up in, up in Buffalo, where they're taking care of, of refugees. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so excited about what Ruth... And Steve are doing in Buffalo. Because one of the things that I, I've heard, and it was funny because we were talking at district conference and to, to, to Ruth, and, and she goes, Yeah, those West, early Wesleyan Methodists were radical, weren't they? I'm like, Yeah, they were. And they were radical because they wanted to share the love of Jesus. They wanted to preach the love of Jesus and they wanted to show the love of Jesus. John says, if we, if God has blessed us with the resources to help a person in need and we don't, God's love isn't in us. Ouch. I don't want to ever be known as someone who God's love is not in because I didn't reach out to somebody. You, as you can tell, this, you know, if I would have preached this two weeks ago, this week that we did the district conference report, this, this message would have come out completely different. But God has been working on my heart over this last two weeks about this message. I like what this says. Next uh, verse. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. John tells us that our faith is illuminated by our love for people. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. Which is the greatest? Love. Love is illuminated. Our faith is illuminated through love. During Sunday school, we were talking a little bit a couple weeks ago, and uh, we were in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, and Paul writes this, he says, Dear friends, you have always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. 
I want you to notice, there, there's, there's a couple things operating here. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it says in the, in the, in the King James. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. And He does that through the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, a lot of times, we struggle with this thought of working out our salvation. After all, salvation is a gift. I, I will not argue that one with you one bit this morning. Salvation is a gift. It is a free gift of God. There is nothing we can do to earn it. However, our faith is worked out through love and good deeds. James 4, 4, James 4, 14 through 17. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Our faith is worked out in love. What if? What if? What if we love God with everything we have and love others as ourself. John tells us that our actions will show that we belong to the truth. What if every... Go, go back to the... Stay, just stay on that, line, that slide right there. We're not going to go to that slide. What if every believer in McKean County would love God with everything we have and love others as themselves. Do you think that would make a difference in our county? I certainly do. What if every believer in the state of Pennsylvania did that? Do you think Pennsylvania would be a different state than it is today? What if everybody who claims to be in love with Jesus throughout the United States did? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? What about the whole world? What if we just simply focused on the great commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself? And I want to say that I don't have it all figured out. But God is teaching me. God is giving me compassion for our community. When, when I saw the, 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 the news about the fire, my heart broke. When I heard the news about Paul this morning, my heart broke. I, re I really want to encourage you this morning, you know, because... There, there, there's, there, there's a lot that's going on in our nation um, as we come up to this birthday of our this great nation. There's a lot of stuff that's going on, and there's a lot of there's a lot of information out of there, out there, and a lot of it's some of it's good and some of it's bad. And when it comes to some of the major issues that are going on, I want us to think not. How would I think as a Republican or how would I think as a Democrat? Or not how would I think as a Libertarian? But I want us to ask that question. How would I think as Jesus thinks about this issue? How can I show Christ's love in this issue? I think of the various things that are on the table. 
in our country. And I want us to think, how would Jesus respond? How would Jesus respond? It is important to show the truth through our actions. Actually, we can skip to the very last slide, James. We must believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He commanded us. Those who obey God's commandment remain in fellowship with Him, and He with them. And we know He lives in us, because the spirit he gave us lives in us. In the Old Testament, Micah chapter 6. The prophet declares, People, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This morning, I want to challenge you to follow the God of justice. Sometimes, so, sometimes we think, well, it, I just, I Sometimes we just say, well, I'm just going to live my life and I'm, I'm going to follow all Jesus' commands. I'm going to do what he tells me, tells me to do. I'm going to come to church, but sometimes it's more than coming to church. Sometimes God calls us to action. 